Um, one other thing before we actually get in our study here and uh, try to be a bit more uh, relaxed, less formal this evening, we really try to do a little bit of Bible study actually. Um, but I, I want you to know that on January the 1st this year, I started reading the Bible. I didn't sign up on the Bible reading uh, list out there because we were still in the pandemic and Angie and I were worshiping from home. Uh, but I started on January 1, uh, so it was a mental ascent to reading my Bible this year. And uh, I have completed reading uh, the entire Bible uh, now uh, already. And don't come and tell me how good that is and how great that is. I'm just trying to make up for all the times in, in my life that I didn't read the Bible. What a precious story. And so me reading or not reading the Bible is not the point of this discussion here. What I'm trying to point out is, is that we have this program about Bible reading, and I know our leaders encourage that, and I want to encourage them to encourage that. But the thing that's on my mind this evening is we every year have a celebration dinner where you get a steak if you read your Bible. And for my budgeting purposes next year, fiscal in 2022, I'm just wondering if I read the Bible again, which I intend to do. I actually hope to do it two more times. Do I get one steak or three steaks? And I don't know who runs that program, but I want you, if there's not an elder that runs that program, but a deacon, then get with the elders and let's get that decision made because that's going to figure into my budgeting because we can take those steaks and divide it by three. And if I get Angie through the Bible twice, then that would be five stakes times three. You see where I'm going on this. And so whoever's in charge of that, I want you to get after that. And let's get some decisions made and get back with me. It's not going to be a motivator or demotivator about me reading the Bible, but it does have some financial implications that I want to work on. That's my story. So listen, we are, a, uh, we are a Bible reading church, and we should be a Bible reading church. And when I think about the Bible and my thinking about how I approach the Bible, uh, I really think about uh, that in three different veins or in three different arenas. And uh, I think the, the very first thing that comes to my mind is just Bible study. Just Bible study. I'm not talking about Bible reading. I'm talking about Bible study. And that's the prep preparation I really do before maybe I read a text, before I read uh, a section of Scripture. And, uh, you know, Isaiah, I believe, is, is one of the most challenging books in the Bible because Isaiah is not just prophesying about Israel or Judah or Israel and Judah. I mean, God has him prophesying about every nation in the world and what's going to happen to them. And he switches horses so many times in his book, which is a lengthy book, that if you don't really have a handle on, on who he's talking about and where he's going, you may not get the actual thought stream that he has on his mind or that God has put on his mind. And so when I get to the book of Isaiah, I kind of have to slow down and I'll read a couple of three chapters. And sometimes I have to go do some Bible study to know the time period that we're in and who we're talking about and kind of what the theme of the story is. And so Bible study to me is not preparation for sermons or Bible class or anything of that nature. Bible study is just getting some facts and some information about whatever passage I might be looking at so that I can, a context around that passage so I can better comprehend what I'm doing when I get into that text. Now Bible reading, see all three of these have Bible in it, Bible study, Bible reading. Bible reading is just sitting down and reading. I just love the story of the Bible. That's one of the reasons I'm done reading it is I just love the story of the Bible from cover to cover. There's just no other piece of literature like it. And if you sit down and read it and read a bunch of chapters at once, particularly if you read like 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles all at one setting, I mean you get a really robust picture of history. I mean it's just beautiful. And so Bible reading is just a great thing to just sit down and you can do it in comfort and ease. Uh, you know, 
Paul made a real interesting observation to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy where he says, and give yourself to the reading of the Scriptures. Now, in the New International Version, they've inserted the word the public reading of the Scriptures because in the synagogues, they would stand up and read the Scriptures and they would expound upon them. And I'm sure that Paul was telling Timothy, be sure and watch, listen to what they read to be sure they get it right. But in the Greek, the word public reading is not there. Just reading of the Scripture. Give yourself to the reading of the Scriptures so that you'll be made whole. And so it's just a beautiful concept. Bible study, then doing some Bible reading. And then the one thing that is probably the most difficult about this three-pronged uh, attack on Scripture when I go that way, and uh, what I want you to think about is Bible application. What in the world did the Holy Spirit want me to learn from that little bit of study and that little bit of Bible reading? What in the world? I mean, the Holy Spirit put all this together for a reason. And we know some of those reasons, they're outlined in Scripture. But sometimes to get the application, you really have to sit back and do a little bit of thinking about it. And we've seen that. And in, in, in listen, this is not meant, this is, this is just, listen, this, you just got to know my heart on this subject. This is just not about criticizing anybody who's ever taught a Bible class. That's just not on my heart. And if you go there, then you just, then, you know, then you need to repent. We'll have an invitation here just a little bit. But we've seen Bible teachers who are really good at gathering up scriptures, right? They get a topic and they get a bunch of scriptures and they're really good at Bible reading. And those classes are, are, are profitable to us. But they're not near as profitable as the individual who takes some scripture and puts them together and then finds application in there of how it applies actually to our, what did the Holy Spirit really want me to learn through that Bible class study. And that's just a whole different arena and that takes effort and time. So this evening, in just the very few minutes that we have, I hope to do all three of those right here with you this evening. I want to do Bible study, I want to do Bible reading, and I want to do Bible application. And we're going to do that out of one book. If you have your Bible, you should be turning, or your cell phone, or whatever you use, you should be turning to the book of Jonah. Now we're going to put Jonah up on the screen, and we're going to have the entire text up here that if you didn't bring your Bible, because some people don't on Sunday night, we're going to read all 48 verses of the book of Jonah. We're going to get to that reading in just a moment. But before we get to that reading, I want to set a little bit of a stage of what's going on. We know about Saul, David, and Solomon, the three kings that ruled over all 12 tribes, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, they ruled over all 12 tribes. It's just one kingdom. It's called Israel. And then Solomon dies and the kingdom splits. Ten northern tribes that have a king and two southern tribes that have a king. Still 12 tribes, but now split with two kings. And the first two kings after Solomon of that divided kingdom, one guy's name is Jeroboam and the other guy's name is Rehoboam. Jeroboam is the king of the northern ten tribes. And you're saying, what in the world could that have to do with the book of Jonah? Well, Jeroboam was the first king of Israel, the northern ten tribes. But by the time you get to the book of Jonah, there is a king on the throne now whose name is also Jeroboam. That's not the first Jeroboam. He is the thirteenth king after the original king, after the king divide, kingdom divides. And so he's 13 kings later. And you recall that a lot of these kings reigned for 21 years, 17 years, 11 years, 41 years. So we're talking about a, a Jeroboam at the time of Jonah who is centuries away from Jeroboam 1. As a matter of fact, scholars actually refer to the first Jeroboam when the kingdom first split as Jeroboam 1. And this king with Jonah as Jeroboam 2, just for clarity. That wasn't his last name. 2 was not his last name. It's just a Roman numeral 2, so scholars can make a distinction. Now, the world power at the time that Jonah's book takes place, the story takes place, is about uh, 700 to 750 B.C., 750 years before Christ, roughly. That's when Jeroboam II was on the throne. And if you read in 2 Kings chapter uh, 25, you will see that 
that Jeroboam too is on the throne and that he has a prophet whose name is Jonah the son of Amittai. That is exactly the description of Jonah in verse 1 of the book of Jonah. That there is a fellow named Jonah and he is the son of Amittai. And Jeroboam, Jeroboam 2 in 750, 775 B.C. says, and this is my prophet. So Jeroboam 2 recognizes Jonah, establishes Jonah as a legitimate prophet and as the recognized prophet in the kingdom of Israel, the northern ten tribes. Now you might read Samaria sometimes or the king of Samaria. Samaria and Israel, the northern ten tribes, are synonymous with each other. Samaria didn't start out as the, king, the capital city of, of the northern ten tribes. The sixth king, Amre, actually established Samaria as the capital city. But in scripture, when you read Samaria or Israel, the northern ten tribes, they're synonymous. And so here, Jonah, son of Amittai, is recognized as the legitimate prophet for Jeroboam II in Israel of the northern ten tribes. Now, there's another fact worth mentioning. I said uh, 2 Kings uh, 25. I meant 2 Kings 14, actually. And it's verse 25. It's verse 25. So take that and look it up correctly. So it's interesting in, in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 that Jeroboam 2 happens to be the king, we're told, that reestablishes all of the borders of Israel. He now goes and claims back all the land. Well, where, where, what happened to that land? Where did it go? Well, we're told that Assyria, or actually Syria and Assyria, who are the world powers at that time, have invaded the northern area of Israel, and they've captured some of the land, and they've captured some of the cities. Now, there is a, 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 a two, actually a king that's two kings before Jeroboam II, that goes out and he challenges the Assyrians and he reclaims some of the cities, but he doesn't establish, reestablish all the borders. Jeroboam II, with Jonah as his prophet, is the king that now reestablishes the border exactly as God had promised him to Abraham. So a very important king that rebuilds the borders exactly as God wants them built with Jonah as his prophet. Now that would lead me to believe... It just leads me to believe that there are many, many, many other prophecies of Jonah that the Holy Spirit decided not to put in this book. Because he is, according to 2 Kings 14, the recognized prophet of the king. And while Jonah is listed as a minor prophet, he really doesn't have any prophecy in the book of Jonah outside of one. And that one prophet is, Nineveh, if you don't repent in 40 days, I'm going to destroy you. So really the book of Jonah is not so much a book of prophecy as it is the story of Jonah and his personal feelings about how he sees God potentially saving Assyria and Nineveh. It's really that story and not so much about prophecy, even though it is listed as a minor prophet. Now see, that's, that's Bible study. Maybe you knew some of those things. Maybe you didn't know any of those things. But one thing I now know is when I read the book of Jonah, I have a context to better understand that which I'm about to read. One other point that I'd probably want to know or that I'd be interested in is the fact that Jesus also, you know, Jesus, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the letters in red in the New Testament, the words of Jesus, do you know that he only mentions four, he mentions, let me be careful here or you'll misunderstand what I'm fixing to say. He mentions a lot of the prophets, but Jesus only mentions four prophets who have books that are written in the Bible. There's other prophets that he mentions, but they don't have a specific book that belongs to them, like Jonah. But if you recall, Jesus said when the people asked for a sign, he said, I'm not going to give you a sign. You got the sign of Jonah. He was three days in the belly of the fish, and he came out of the belly of the fish. I'm going to be three days in the belly of the earth, just like Jonah, and I'm coming out of the earth. 
And that's the only sign you get. So, of the four prophets that Jesus mentioned specifically that have books written after him, Jonah was one of the four. And he says, I'm going to be just like him. So I've got a king in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 14, that validates that Jonah is a legitimate prophet, an important guy in the nation. And I've got Jesus saying that the sign of Jonah is important, and he validates Jonah as well. So now I read the book of Jonah with confidence, knowing that it's real, the story is real, the prophet is real, everything about it is real. So let's read the book of Jonah, now that you have a little bit of context there. Um, and I'm going to move away from this Bible here because my eyes have gotten older. Uh, I, I don't know how that happened. And I actually printed this on about 20 font here so I can see it. You're going to be really good here with me reading this now. Um, so, let's begin. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is a Phoenician outpost. Jonah was commanded to go northwest, or northeast, I'm sorry, northeast. He headed due west to Tarshish. Tarshish would be today in the country of Spain. And at that time, it was the furthest western outpost in the world. He couldn't have gone any further, and there'd be civilization. So he gets on a boat and he heads for Tarshish. Keep reading with me. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the ferry, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And, and the reason he fleed from the Lord, just let me give you a couple of side notes here, is because nobody loved Nineveh. When he was told to go to Nineveh, nobody loves Nineveh. Nobody ever loved Nineveh. I mean, every nation that is a heathen nation that refuses to repent, repent, is going to destruction, is going to its own ruin. History tells us that. That's true of every nation that's ever existed. It's true of America. It's true of every nation that ever will exist. A nation that refuses to repent is on its way to ruin. And Nineveh was on its way to ruin. There was nobody like Nineveh. They hated Nineveh. Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh made pyramids out of people's heads of nations they conquered where they went in and took the kings and the princes and the noblemen, cut off their heads and piled them into piles. They actually took, they actually took the, the, the hierarchy of these countries that they, they conquered and, and they, they flayed the skin off of them. I, I don't, uh, uh, Ken and Janice came out to fish uh, here a while back and, and uh, Angie caught about a, a, a 5.2 pound catfish and uh, Ken had his old black pickup down there and he said, do you want me to fillet it? And Ken didn't, Ken didn't, didn't kill that fish. He laid that old fish up on the tailgate of that truck and he took a knife and he ran it right down the gill while that fish, fish was laying there flopping a little bit. And he cut right down there and cut that meat off and he turned that fish over and did the same thing. And then he put the fish back in, in, the, in, in the pond down there for feed for the other fish. That's what exactly Assyria was doing to the people that they captured. They would just flay that skin off on while they lay there alive. Nobody loved Nineveh. And so when Jonah's told to go to Nineveh, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. Keep reading with me, please. Verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose, the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each one cried out to his own God. They threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah, why, he'd gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out how who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and oddly enough, the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, uh, Tell us, who, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where did you come from? What is your country? What people are you from? He answered, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and made the dry land. This, this terrified them and they asked, well, what have you done? They knew that he was running away from the Lord because they had already told them that he was running away from the Lord. The sea was getting rougher and tougher and rougher, and so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down here for us? Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. 
and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you. Lord, have done this as you pleased. So they took Jonah, and they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the man greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now I want to stop right here and make a little bit of a distinction because this is kind of important to our Bible study. There's a lot of difference between an act of God and a miracle. Now there are miracles in the book of Jonah, no doubt. But sometimes we count just normal acts of God as miracles when in fact they are not. I mean really, is there anything too abnormal about out in the sea, uh, tempestuous rage rising up from the waves? and eventually growing calm. I mean, isn't that how the oceans and the seas just behave? Isn't that exactly how God made them? And so there's no miracle in the fact that there is an incredibly huge storm, and there's really no miracle in the fact that that eventually calms down and grows calm. Now, there might be a miracle in the fact that God appointed the time thereof, but the act itself is just a normal act of God. Now, on the other hand, well, and I would even say that being swallowed by a big fish is not necessarily a miracle. I mean, they captured a 30,000-pound sperm whale off the coast of Florida in 1912. The width of the mouth on that sperm whale was 38 inches wide. It's in the Smithsonian Institute. I'm not making this one up. I don't lie, well, I don't lie about anything. I start to say I lie about some things, but I really don't lie about anything. But I'm not making this one up. This is a true fish story. It's in, it's in the Smithsonian. 38-inch wide mouth. Imagine that thing being opened. Do you think it could suck in a man? As a matter of fact, when they got that sperm whale to shore and they examined it, they found a 50... Uh, a 5,000 pound, sorry, 1,500 pound, 1,500 pound, the facts are, the 1,500 pound blackfish in its stomach, whole, it had not been digested yet. And so the, the concept of a, of a big fish, I mean, you get in the wrong water with the wrong fish, it's not going to work out for you. And so there's nothing there as far as miracles are concerned. But the preservation of a man in the belly of a fish for three days with the digestive juices not doing any damage and the skin not wrinkling up, and the skin not dissolving, that's miracle. That's miracle. And so, we need to be sure that we distinguish when we read the book here the difference between miracles happen and what are natural acts of God. Now let's keep reading. So Jonah is now thrown into the water. And in verse 17, last verse of chapter 1, Now the Lord provided, the New International Version says, provided, there's other texts that say appointed, a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Now I want you to pay attention. In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. He doesn't answer Jonah in this prayer. He answers Jonah in the fact that he causes the fish to vomit him out on dry land in a moment. That's how Jonah knows that, that God answered him. But listen to his prayer. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the rim of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves of breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me to... to uh, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me uh, barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit when my life was ebbing away. I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you into your holy temple. Those who cling to worthy idols turn away from uh, God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord, here's the answer, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That's a miracle. Chapter 3. And by the way, chapter 3, God doesn't know what to do with Jonah, but to treat 
Jonah exactly as he treats us. He gives us a command, we rebel, and he just starts over with us. And that's exactly what he does with Jonah. Chapter 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. So <clears throat> I think some texts say three days journey. What it's trying to say to us is that they suspect that the wall around, just the wall around Nineveh was eight miles in circumference. It is one large city. And that doesn't count all the extensions around the city, all the suburbs that are around the city. And so when it says it takes three days to go there and preach the message, it means by the time he goes to all the suburbs and all the areas he needs to preach, he's going to be there for a while. It's a great big city. And so he starts his preaching. In verse 4, Jonah began uh, by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 days, and then it would be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation that the king issued in Nineveh. By the, key, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Don't let people eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Just maybe, just maybe, God will relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we as a nation, as a city, will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he did relent and he did not bring them in the destruction he had threatened. But, you know, to Jonah in chapter 4, this seemed very, very wrong. And he became angry. And Jonah prayed to the Lord, isn't this exactly what I told you, Lord? When I was still at home, when I was still in the comfort of my living room, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and that you are compassionate. You're slow to anger. You're bound in love. You're a God who relents from such calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Jonah, is it, is it right for you to be angry? Is it, is, it, is it good for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out of the city, and he sat down in a place east of the city. And there, Jonah was so angry, he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, a gourd plant, and he made it grow over Jonah's head to give him shade, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But at dawn, the very next day, the Lord provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered away. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, it would have been better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah said, it is. He said, I am angry and I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. The plant grew up overnight. Miracle. And it died overnight. Miracle. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right from the left, and also have many animals? And so here's old Jonah in chapter 4. And he's first angry over Nineveh being spared. And then he's angry over the gourd plant not being spared. And he says, I just wish I was dead. See, nobody loved Nineveh, particularly a Hebrew. And so now I gave you a little bit of context, Bible study. We did some Bible reading. I wonder what in the world the Holy Spirit would want me to learn out of the book of Jonah. I wonder what messages could come out of there, and I just have a couple for you. The first one that comes to my mind is that you just simply cannot run 
from God or his assignment. In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8, we taught that a couple of years ago. In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel is commanded to go into the temple court. And he goes into the temple court, and on the wall, there's a small hole in the wall. And God says to that prophet, dig in that hole and tell me what you see. And so Jonah digs that hole out so he can look in there. And when he looks in there, he sees this inner room. And in this inner room are all the shepherds, all the elders, all the leaders of Israel, the folks who should be leading Israel in the paths of righteousness. And they're in this inner room. And the reason that, jo that uh, uh, Ezekiel can see them is because they all have candles and they have incense. And so the, the room is lit because these, 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 these elders, these shepherds are in the room and they're in there and they're, and they're worshiping all the figures that are on the, all the idolatrous figures that are on the walls in that inner room. And you know what? They believe they are doing it in secret. They think that they can hide from God and go in there and worship these idols and not worry about it. But God knew exactly where to send Ezekiel to look because you just can't run from God. It's just impossible. <clears throat> Another thing that I'm sure <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit would like for me to learn out of the book of Jonah, and I'm not too keen on this one, but it doesn't mean it's not Bible truth. And, and let me just say something there. When we begin to make application of Scripture, we have to be careful because some people apply Scripture to prove their point. We're looking for what the Holy Spirit wants us to learn, not what we think we should learn. And the second thing that he says to me here is that if God asks me to do something that's disagreeable, if he enjoins a disagreeable duty or responsibility, you know what, as funny as it seems, it's far easier for me to go do it than to not do it. It's just easier to go do it, even though... I may not think it's easier. You know, Angie and I have a really, I think, a really good marriage. I don't want you guys to go to her and ask her about that, but I think we have a really good marriage. Uh, but sometimes uh, she doesn't get everything exactly right. Babe, I'm sorry. She doesn't get everything exactly right. And anybody in this room who says they've never had a dispute or a disagreement with their wife, um, I doubt that. And I can remember when we were a whole lot younger, a whole, whole lot younger, and sometimes when we would disagree and she couldn't see the error of her way, that, that, we, would, that we would have a little bit of conflict. And, and through that conflict, as it escalated, sometimes we wouldn't talk for two or three days. Any you had an experience or am I the only one? Well, I didn't think so, but we wouldn't talk for two or three days. Or if we did talk, it wasn't marriage talk. It was like, what do you want for dinner? And it was like, you know, are you going to go to the store? And it was just about that terse, right? And, and I know that what God wanted me to do was to hang in there until she saw the light. <laughs> he wanted me to stay in there until she saw the error of her ways and repented. I know that that's what he wanted me to do. Or maybe perhaps what he was really enjoining me to do was to love my wife as the most precious vessel that he could give me here on this earth. And that what he really wanted me to do was for me to repent and acknowledge my shame in that matter. But boy, that is so disagreeable to me. That is just so disagreeable to me. Now, I'm better at it now. Don't misunderstand me. I'm still not a heathen. Well, I still am a heathen, but I'm not as bad a heathen as I used to be. And we're a lot better at it. We still disagree, but we disagree in a much more productive manner than we did, you know, 30 years ago. And I bet you do too if you've been married a long time. Um, but, you know, God really does enjoin us to do some things sometimes that are a little bit disagreeable to us. And it would have been far, looking back, looking back on history now, it would have been, my dinners would have been a whole lot better if I had just done what God had really wanted me to do. It's just been easier. 
And that's always true with everything that God asks us to do, even though we may not understand the reasonableness of it, the rationale behind it, or the end result of it. It's just always easier to do what God asks you to do. And Jonah couldn't get there. He could have saved him airfare or, or, or ship fare over to Tarshish. He could have saved him an opportunity to swim in the ocean. He could have saved an opportunity to be in the belly of the fish. I mean, things would have just been so much easier if he'd just gone to Nineveh and preached what he was supposed to preach and come home. But he just couldn't see it. And sometimes we can't either. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to be sure that I know that. When God asks me to do something, He really does want me to just go do it. And if I'll just trust God, it'll probably be a little bit easier. One of the other things that, uh, as we wrap up here, that I want to say to you is, uh, you know, uh, Jonah, Jonah clearly uh, is a bigot. I mean, he has his opinions, right? His opinions come through the text. And he, he's so beholding to those opinions that he's a bigot. He can't, can't see any other viewpoint or any other way to go. He knows he's right. He's going to hold on to those no matter what. He's going to go to the mat with them. He's just a bigot. Um, now, he's a patriot. And that's a word that's been thrown around a lot the last few years, right? Patriotism, patriot. You know, if you don't choose a side, if you're not on this side, then you must not be a patriot. Well, you know, you can be such a narrow-minded patriot that you can be a bigot. And he was. Because he thought God was only the God of Israel, just like sometimes we think that God is only the God of America. We so Americanize God that nobody else deserves God. The world doesn't deserve God. Look what they're doing over there in the Middle East. Who in the world, who in the world could think that God could be their God? You know, it's pretty easy to become narrow-minded real quick. All in the name of a patriot. I've got a neighbor out there in the country. And I'm hoping he'll, he'll move and become your neighbor. But he's probably going to stay out there with me, what I can see. And uh, I'm not saying you deserve him. I'm just saying that he's out there on the edge. And... Uh, Oh, and this is, this is interesting too. He's uh, not only is out there on the edge, but he's a prayer warrior. He's listed as a prayer warrior at the uh, Lone Star Church there in Montgomery. And uh, the Lord's going to have to really <laughs> help them. Um, but uh, when all this thing happened up in the northeast, uh, northwest, I'm sorry, northwest up in Seattle and Washington where all the riots and everything back in the summertime, y'all all remember that? And... Uh, I'm not his friend on Facebook. I told you a couple of Sundays ago, and I have three, and he ain't one of them. And, uh, but I have a friend who is a friend of his on Facebook, and he showed me his post. And when all that happened out there, uh, his post was, is get your guns and get your ammunition and get ready. They're coming. They're coming. That's what, that's, that was his post. And, um, and he said, and when they show up, you need to be really professional and he said, tell them, use the words when you're, when, you're, when, you're in, when you're keeping them off your property in conflict. Use the words, I am a Texas patriot. I don't know if that was supposed to provide me legal protection if I shot some. I didn't know what that was. But anyway, I didn't go get my guns or my bullets and I didn't do that. Uh, but, but, you know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. He is to the point of being an extremist about something that he labels as patriotism that he thinks gives him certain rights to do certain things that we would deem to be far beyond the scope of what Scripture would allow any man to do. And so we have to be careful. Jonah had to be careful. He wasn't. He should have been. And we have to be careful that we don't become so narrow-minded in our thinking that we so Americanize God that uh, we do it in the name of patriotism because it's not. And so then the very last thing before we stand and sing a song here, that you need to know that just one of the things the Holy Spirit wanted to tell us in Jonah was that God will be gracious to anyone who repents. Isn't that, isn't that just sweet to know? that when you mess up, and we all do, that God will be gracious 
when we repent. That's just sweetness to me. And it's sweetness to you this evening. If there's something that God can, can help you with by being gracious this evening, he would, sure, he would sure want you to take advantage of that as together we stand and sing.